portion is from Psalm 80. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead just like a flock. You who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God, let your face shine, that we may be saved. Just the Bible which you shall understand.
paper, which reads as follows. To all those for whom Christ hath purchased redemption, he doth certainly and effectually apply and communicate the same, making intercession for them, and revealing unto them, in and by the word, the mysteries of salvation, effectually persuading them by his spirit to believe and obey, and governing their hearts by his word and spirit, overcoming all their enemies by his almighty power and wisdom. In such manner and ways are as are most consonant to his wonderful and unsearchable dispensation. Last week I had to cut my remarks a little bit short in view of um, my throat. Um, we considered last week the unity of Christ's person with his two natures and how effectively his person expresses itself through the two natures, the divine and the human. And we considered that sometimes divine attributes are applied to the human nature and also there are human attributes, or excuse me, human attributes applied to the divine nature. Let me see if I got that straight. Uh, we, we spoke of Acts chapter 20 where God sheds his own blood. And the, the thought is that the language here is kind of a hyperbole. It is uh, a language which uh, emphasizes the infinite value of the blood of Christ. <laughs> is the blood of the, the the one person who is fully God and fully man. God himself does not have blood to shed, uh, but Christ, being fully God and fully man, sheds his blood. His human blood is not merely then uh, sufficient in and of itself to accomplish our redemption. It's through union with the divine that it is empowered to provide a full atonement for all of our sins. Think of it. One good man as a substitute for a second good man might be satisfying the demands of justice. But one man, good man satisfying for the sins of thousands, perhaps millions of people would seem to go beyond the boundaries of justice when justice demands a one-for-one -one substitution. Old covenant law is based on the notion of restitution. You take one thing, that one thing needs to be restored. Quite often there's a penalty reciprocal to that for taking the one thing so that you don't profit by taking it for a period of time. There is a sense of a one-for-one -one exchange. Here, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross is of infinite value because he is fully man and fully God. And so his blood can atone for the sins of all of God's people. By the same token, we can look at the, the reverse side of this and say that human attributes are sometimes applied to the divine nature. Um, Jesus, excuse me, Mary, the mother of Jesus, carrying Jesus in her womb, appears to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth responds and says, How is it that the mother of my Lord has appeared to me? Now here is language that seems a little bit uh, Roman Catholic the mother of my Lord, appearing to me. And some would even go so far as to think that Mary is the mother of God and almost ascribe to her divine attributes. Here again we have a description which takes advantage of Mary's unique role in bringing Jesus into the world. And this Jesus whom she gives birth to is both divine and human. In a sense, she is, if you will, the mother of God, and that it is through her that Jesus come into the world. But she remains ever a human, a finite human. And she remains even a sinful human in need of redemption. So, uh, the, the, the language there should not mislead us. It is uh, part of the way in which God makes use of human language to describe his own work in the world today. In this final concluding section, we move on to the work of Christ in accomplishing fully the work of our salvation. You recall in previous 
comments, we noted that a father has given to his son a unique, distinct portion of people out of the whole of humanity and given him the mission of going into the world on behalf of these people, the elect, and achieving their salvation. His death on the cross was to atone for all of their sins, not all sins of all mankind in general, for if that were the case, then all men must be saved if God is to remain just. He cannot punish Christ for the sins of all mankind and then sweep that aside and go on and punish mankind for their own sins. <coughs> you must have a universal salvation if that is the case. No, that is not the case, but that many do perish in their sins. So the Father has entrusted to the Son a unique portion of humanity and given it to Him for redemption. He goes to the cross and He pays the penalty for their sins. And now this eighth section takes us beyond the work of Christ from the cross to His heavenly work as our Redeemer. Where He takes the benefits of, our, of this redemption and savingly, effectively applies it to us. He is our great high priest. And so when we call out to him for salvation, he gives us the free gift of everlasting life. He blesses his word to our hearts so that we respond to it and believe in faith in that which he has done. <coughs> and so his work is effectual, not only in, in dying for our sins, paying the full penalty and living a perfect righteous life for us, but also now being in heaven and exalted above, he effectively communicates the benefits of his redemption to all the elect, working at times through his spirit, so that we might believe and obey. What is more, having come to faith in Christ, he governs our hearts by his word and spirit, so that we are preserved along the path to glory. Jesus says that he is our good shepherd and we are in his hands. No one can separate us from God. <coughs> well, he's overcome all of our enemies by his almighty power and wisdom. And so there's nothing to stop his great work of redemption. And he does this to his own glory and praise. So, has God done a good work in you as he brought you to a saving knowledge of Christ? That work will come to a conclusion. God will savingly bring you through this life, through all of its temptations and sins and sorrows, and bring you in faith to His heavenly city. Why? Because He loves you, He is committed to you, He is faithful to His Father. Just as He died for you at the cross, He now lives for you in heaven in glory to ensure the fact that you are saved and brought into that heavenly city. So, trust Him.
Genesis chapter 1. In our reading, we say, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have the men over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them. God said to them, fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, <coughs> over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. To every beast of the earth, to every bird of the heavens, to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, and given every great plant for food in the sun. <coughs> God saw everything that they made, before it was very good, and it was evening, it was morning, it was six of the Father in heaven, we pray that your spirit would bless the ministry of the word this morning, that you would build your church and your faith and be good work for service and your will today. We pray that you would strengthen our hearts and love for you and for each other. We ask in Jesus' name. The past few weeks have been rather wild and crazy on the cultural scene. We have an Olympic athlete named Bruce Jenner, who uh, has gone on to national TV and proclaimed that he, though uh, a terrific male athlete, is actually female inside. And he's going to make a transition from being a male to a female. We've had, uh, in the news just this week, a woman who, uh, by the name of Rachel Dolezal, who rose to become the head of the NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. She professed to be colored, black woman. In fact, she is white. Her parents are white. She has her hair fixed as though she looks like she's a black woman and she's very tanned. But you can see pictures of her when she's a teenager and she's a normal white young lady. What is it that has come over her that she would pass herself off as a black woman? We have the Supreme Court now considering gay marriage and whether gay marriage ought to be uh, legal throughout the United States. The significance of that was not lost on the justices as they heard arguments before the court. Uh, they understood that a law in this regard would have tremendous ramifications uh, over the, the course of, of our society, our culture, our nation. It would reflect, it would have to reflect on millennia of human custom and behaviors and a reversal of these behaviors in sanctioning gay marriage. Uh, what is rather remarkable is one that is just such a small portion of the American population that is in fact gay or homosexual, only two to four percent. <coughs> only two to four percent are themselves gay or homosexual. Yet they have seemed to have swept across academia, swept across the media, the legal establishment, uh, so many aspects, major corporations, in such a way that it is now the cultural or hip thing to support gay marriage. 
This is an amazing transformation of our country, really over the past 10 years. In fact, the president professes to have only come around to this within the last couple of years, uh, at, at the time of his, right after his second uh, inauguration. What has come over our country? That this kind of, if you will, massive self-delusion, let me put it that way, has swept across the nation. It is a form of self-delusion. Uh, you look at Bruce Jenner and his uh, pre presentation of himself as a woman inside. Historically, psychologists have defined this transgender uh, personality as uh, a deviant personality, as one which is psychologically in trouble. And yet, today we're embracing it, we're celebrating it. Same thing with uh, the homosexual lifestyle, that also is viewed as a deviant lifestyle, psychologically it was classified as a disorder. <coughs> but in the modern world today, we seem to be embracing it. Canada already has approved it. Other European nations have approved it. It seems like we are being swept along in this uh, trans transformation. As Jesus spoke with his disciples and, and the Pharisees as well about marriage, from the beginning it was not so. In the beginning, God made man and woman, made a marriage between the two of them, and formed that partnership from the very start. This is the way that God designed the human race, that we should come together as man and woman with a, a, a mutual uh, complement of gifts, skills, and abilities to serve in our common cultural task. <coughs> so, when we look at the beginning and the description that Moses gives of the creation of man, we see here the fundamental structures that organize all of life. When some in our modern culture today wish to sweep this aside and simply look at the feelings involved in the homosexual relationship, for example, and suggest that it is okay for a gay relationship to be formed because they're happy and they found love in each other, We have to say to these folks that you are violating the fundamental structure on which humanity is based. And that does not have, that cannot happen without consequences. Just as with this transgender man, Bruce Jenner, <coughs> every fiber of his being identifies him as a male. You cannot look at his body and say that he is a female. Uh, right down to your genetic code, the form of your skeleton, the, the way your muscles fire, um, the, the um, stature of your body, all these many things set you apart as a male. And an attempt to try to change some parts around does not affect that at all. You still have a male body, no matter what hormones you might add to that. Similarly, a female body is unique and different. The texture of a woman's hair is different from a man's hair. Her skin is different from a man's skin. There's so many different things about women and men that it's clear that you cannot just simply transform the two of them, or blend them together. You're inescapably male or female. You might even go to the soul, which is the point of the transgender. I, in my soul, am trapped in a male body or in a female body. And so there's this disharmony between what's inside and what's outside. The two don't 
cohere. Even that fails. You recognize that men think differently than women. They feel differently than women. They go about things differently than women. Women, by the same token, do the same. We are different internally, and that can't be changed. A man tends to think from point A to point B. Woman kind of wanders around <laughs> and eventually gets to point B with bringing in a lot of context. Quite often that's the case. Now, I'm generalizing, and there are certain, it's not true of every circumstance, but it's generally true. Uh, here's my bachelorhood, right? The shamanist. Men come to conclusions in different ways than women. Uh, there, it, there are differences in the way that we are made, all the way around. Women are more nurturing. You know, that again might appear to be chauvinistic, but typically women are more caring for children than what men will be. They have greater patience for children than what men would have. They are better suited for raising children than what men are. There are different ways in which we relate to each other. One uh, writer in our, who's written a book, and, and Gender, just the title of the book, and a chapter of that was included in World Magazine's uh, online post, noted that Men provide women with security, and women provide men with rest. And these are the different ways in which we relate to each other. Men provide a home, and they protect their wives in their home, or in society. They lay down their life for the wife, for her safety and well-being. By the same token, the woman provides a home for the husband, a place of refuge where he can come home from work and relax and be refreshed. These are, again, generalizations, but they provide some of the basic ways in which we relate to each other. This is part of the real fabric of our humanity. And you can see that right from the very start, the way that God created mankind in Genesis chapter 1. You look at the verses that we read a moment ago, and you find God stepping back from his work of creation, as it were, and purposefully deliberating about the, the, the creation of man. Earlier in the chapter, each step along the way is just simply, let there be light, let there be uh, an expanse above the, the, the earth, and let the waters be divided, and all these things, just let it happen. But when he comes to the very end, when he's going to consider making man, as it were, mankind, he steps back and is more reflective and deliberative in the process. It says, let us make man <coughs> in our own image and in our own likeness. And so what we find here is that man is very much the height of creation, the high point of creation. <coughs> and what is more, he is distinct from the rest of creation. He bears a unique relationship to God that the rest of the creation does not have. He is made in the image of God, whereas the creatures are not. He is set apart for a special relationship with God as one who is responsible for governing God's creation in God's place. And so God deliberates, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Now when we look at that language there, certain things come to our attention, particularly the plural number here. Let us make men in our image. We've already seen glimpses of, if you will, the plurality within God. Earlier in the chapter, when you have God creating things and God saying, let there be light, and also when the Spirit of God hovers over the waters of the earth already hints at the very start to a plurality within God. It's not filled out, it's not fleshed out, not explained entirely, but there are hints of that present right there from the beginning. 
When here in the 26th verse it says, let us make man in our image. <coughs> God, I believe, is talking within the persons of the divine Godhead, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. There have been a number of different approaches over time where some have taken a look at this plurality and suggested, well, maybe what God is doing is just simply using a majestic plural for the singular. I will do this or that, and instead of just saying I, I'll make it sound much more grand by saying we will do this or that, as though the President of the United States would say, we are going to do this or that. We are going to sign this document, this trade document, what have you. There's kind of a majestic plural, and some think that that's uh, what's taking place here. Others suggest that God is consulting with his heavenly court, with the angels who are all around him. And asking them to take part in the deliberations about the creation of man. The problem with that is that man is not made in the image of the angels. He's made in the image of God. And so the cons consultation of the angels is uh, to no purpose. I think clearly the text is arguing for a plurality within the Godhead. The Spirit of God, God the Creator, the Lord God, I might even say the Son, Father, Son, and Spirit. In any case, this plurality within the unity of the Godhead, one God, in His plurality, deliberating about the creation of the, this high mark of, of creation, the creation of man, determines to make man in His own image. Now, The image of God in which man is made sets man apart from the rest of creation from animals. In a modern evolutionary worldview which dismisses God and views man as arising from the lower orders of creation, we destroy any sense of man being made in the image of God. Man is nothing more than an animal. He is on the same level as the rest of the animal world, yes, is more evolved, more developed. But at heart, there's nothing that special about him. When you come to that point in your thinking, then it becomes very easy to have abortion on demand, to provide euthanasia at the end of life for those who are unnecessary. It becomes, it becomes possible with uh, Herr Hitler to to describe one race as a superior race and defective races as having to be purged from the earth. An evolutionary worldview makes that possible. After all, we kill off mosquitoes, don't we? <laughs> we, if we kill off all kinds of animals that are problems for us. Why not kill off certain humans that are problems for us? There's no sense man be made in the image of God. And that's a tragic loss in our culture today. <coughs> God makes man in his image. And that image is reflected, if you will, in a, a number of ways. Theologians over time and history have tried to explain that image in different ways. Some think that the, the dual words here, image and likeness, reflect man being made as body and soul, as outward nature and as inward nature. is one possible explanation for that. Uh, others suggest that it, it's talking about man's rationality and his volition. Man is made in the in, image of God. He's, he's a reasonable man, also able to make decisions. Um, those may be aspects of that, but I don't think that that's the kind of distinction that's being drawn there. Calvin and, and more recent Reformed theologians have considered that these terms, image and likeness, are mostly synonymous. There are nuances, uh, connotations to them that might give a little bit of difference. Likeness tends to emphasize the distinction between God and man. We are not God, we are not a, a divine, but we are like God. And so there's something about God that's communicated to us which we experience and enjoy that makes us in the image of God. 
how do we describe that? I think the text gives us a, a couple of indications here and doesn't answer all of the questions you might have for it. Further scriptures add more to our concept of the image of God in man. But the image, I think here in this text, tends to focus on the fact that man himself also is made in a plurality. He'll make man in his image. Male and female will he make them. There's kind of a, a uniqueness to the Hebrew in the way that it, it, it discusses this. It says, and it uses kind of a reflective pattern in the, 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 the grammar of the, the language itself. God made him in his image. In the image of God made him man. And the one sentence is kind of the reflection of the other. Or the one frame clause is the reflection of the other. Man is made in the image of God. And there's a kind of duality there. Man is made as male and female. And, and so there's a certain sense in which man before God is a plurality. He's male and female. And in some ways, that reflects the nature of God, who is a plurality, Father, Son, and Spirit. Plurality in the midst of unity, unity in the midst of plurality. Within the human system. Both are made in the image of God, and both have this function given to them of exercising cultural dominion over the earth. Mankind as a whole, in his plurality as man and woman, are responsible for subduing the earth and controlling it. And so God entrusts to man this great responsibility of developing the world that he's given to us, ruling it, subduing it. One might think that's rather odd in a world that's perfectly created and made new. It needs to be ruled and subdued. Even a perfect world needed to be governed, managed, cultivated, so that all of its inner potentials could be realized. And it was the cultural mission of, of man as male and female to achieve that end. Now, when you embrace the, the gay marriage movement or the transgender movement or any of these kinds of things which ultimately are leading to an androgynous society where the distinctions between male and female are dismissed or at least absorbed into each individual person so that they might have balance, as Shirley MacLaine talks about, going deep within. Uh, there, there's a sense that our culture is moving into an androgynous future where the distinctions between male and female are erased and we can all be one whole within ourselves, male and female, balanced and mature in their view. When you embrace that kind of worldview, you disrupt the way in which male and female reflect the image of God <coughs> and all the ways in which that image is reflected. And what is more, you disrupt their cultural mission of filling the earth, multiplying and filling the earth and subduing it, ruling over it. So culture is disrupted and man made in the image of God is disrupted when we begin to to challenge the way that God formed and fashioned our humanity. These are very dangerous things. Emil Bruner, in, in commenting on Genesis chapter 1, made note that we arrive here at the very life force of humanity, and we do not touch on these things without doing great harm. Man made as male and female. It's part of who we are and part of God's design for the world around us. Male and female in particular formed in marriage. 
for the purpose of raising children, raising families, developing businesses, subduing the earth. The gay marriage movement is not simply after finding happiness for a few people and celebrating their great love. It's really about destroying marriage all across the board. What you find is that when, for example, in San Francisco, when marriage among gays is legalized, yes, there are a few that get married, but the majority of gay men, for example, don't get married. The purpose is not so much for them to be married, but to have the financial benefits of it. The purpose is to destroy marriage on the whole. Well, that gets us in far afield into the development of, of that. But here, God at the very beginning describes how he has made man. And if we try to toy with that fundamental architecture of our humanity, we're going to do great harm. And, and you can see that working itself out now in terms of health. The gay lifestyle is very unhealthy lifestyle. To enumerate the list of diseases that gay men especially are prone to would, would be astonishing. The lifestyle of a gay man is about 20 years shorter than the lifestyle of a heterosexual man. 20 years of life are lost when you embrace that lifestyle. Psychologically, there are all kinds of consequences to that relationship. All kinds of depressions, suicides, um, aberrant behaviors are associated with the gay lifestyle. There are dramatic consequences to an embrace of gay marriage. And so when our Supreme Court looks at these things, they cannot simply decide this on the basis of a popularity vote on the basis of the, the movement of history, if you will, or satisfying the electorate, they need to be mature enough to stand up and speak truth to power, to use a liberal phrase, and say that you are being deluded. This lifestyle is harmful. It's not for your good. It's destructive for you. It's destructive to the culture and society and it's harmful to the church as, as well. It's a whole other matter. But you cannot just simply rationalize these things away and talk about human experience. You have to recognize that there are religious dimensions at work here that need to be taken into account. God made man in this way. And if you dismiss the Christian God or the Christian description of human nature and simply try to evaluate this on social terms, you never escape a religious foundation. You're simply replacing one foundation with another. And the other foundation, as Dr. Peter Jones has so clearly explained, is pagan. <coughs> Excuse me, paganism. It is pagan. And that's the movement that is sweeping across our culture today. Nothing less than androgynous paganism. A return to the gods of the past. A return to the notion that we're all part of God. And so the Supreme Court cannot simply contend itself by arguing on legal terms or rational terms cultural terms, societal terms, psychological terms, all those things need to come into view, but it must also take into account God's word and God's description of who we are. And dismissing that description will leave us open to pray to every kind of delusion that sweeps across the earth. And before long, we're all black. Before long, we're all gay. Before long, we can be whatever we want because we're living in a fantasy world. And we can do as we please because we are the masters of our fate, the captains of our soul. It's a delusion. 
It's a mental disorder. And somebody needs to be clear enough to say, no, we will not allow our culture to go down this path. It is harmful and destructive. With this. A number of evangelicals have come out in favor of gay marriage. Tony Campalo, who is a, a more liberal, uh, social liberal Christian, uh, has come out in favor of gay marriage after his great prayers and meditation on scripture and so forth. He's come out to that point. He doesn't explain his theological basis for that, but he's announced that. You have over in Ireland, the whole country adopting gay marriage by a 62% margin. And professedly Christian folks, like uh, I believe it was Bono with you two, uh, arguing that Christianity should embrace this and, and celebrate the union of love between a gay couple. And people are just following along with this delusion that because two people seem to be in love with each other, that that ought to be celebrated and preserved. However you find love, that ought to be celebrated and preserved. I can find happiness in a lot of places. I can find happiness by going to the, the, the bar and drinking a few beers. I can find happiness by shooting myself up with heroin and get real high. And then I can say to you, why should you judge me? Let me have my happiness. You should celebrate the fact that I'm a heroin addict. You should celebrate the fact that I'm a drunker. Because I feel really great when I'm drunk. But we don't allow that, do we? We step in with these people and we stop them. We tell them what you're doing is wrong. It's harmful and destructive. It's what we need to say to the gay community, to the transgender community, to all those that embrace these kinds of alternative lifestyles. It's a delusion and a deception. And the sooner you reject that, and embrace what God's plan is for you, the sooner you'll be on the path to happiness, true happiness, true life, true productivity in the world today. We don't say this because we hate you. We say it because we love you. This is what love does. It cares enough to confront. It cares enough to tell you the way things truly are. It's not the loving thing to go along and celebrate and facilitate <laughs> and support them in their delusion. That's not a loving thing. It might feel good, but it's not true love. So we need to pray for our Supreme Court, pray for our country, pray for our churches. Their eyes are open to receiving what Scripture has to say about our nature and who we are and how we may be productive in the world that God has given to us. May God bless it to the advance of His kingdom. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word this morning and pray that your spirit would bless it to our hearts. Pray that you give us an understanding of how you have made us and all of the complexity and beauty glory of that model. And we pray, Lord, that you would defend us from those who would seek to sweep that away and attack you and your word and your, uh, your people in this way. So we pray for your blessing on the ministry of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just talk to the Lord of God and bring this song
respond by standing and singing God's prayers.
fathers and want and, and others to raise our children in ways which uh, please you. We pray, Lord, that you would provide for our families, protect and preserve them, and minister to your every need. Father, we pray that you would uh, be with our extended family and minister to their needs as well. We think of others in our church who are not able to be with us today. We pray that you would uh, minister to their needs. We pray for Gloria Coleman. We pray that you give her relief from the pain that she's been experiencing. And we pray that the uh, insurance company would provide her with uh, coverage for an MRI to determine exactly uh, what is causing her pain in her back. <laughs> in her back. Father, we pray for your blessing on that. We pray that you would be with Ella McLaren and continue to bless her with strength that she may recover uh, her ability to walk and we pray that you protect her from harm. And as she is important to be this week, we pray for your blessing uh, on that. Father, we pray for George McLaren. We pray that you comfort him in the loss of his brother, Andy. We thank you for Andy's life and for his marriage. We pray for Marge that you would comfort her lost at this time to be with the family as well. We pray that you would encourage them by your word and help them to trust in you in these times. Father, we pray for all the family as they continue to mourn the loss of John's father. We pray that you give them comfort and strength and renew uh, trust in you. We pray for the provision for uh, John's mother, that you would take care of her and give her comfort and strength at this, at this time. Father, we pray that you be with our elderly who are not able to be with us. We pray for E. Thomas, Larry, and Andy. We pray that you provide for them with health and strength and ministry to their needs. We thank you for Avis being here tonight, today. And we pray that you continue to watch over and protect her and keep her from the fall. We pray that you have strength and provide for her, her health and bless her as she serves you in her home. Father, we pray that you be with those who are looking for work. We pray that you provide and bless them with opportunities. And we pray that you provide for their homes and families. We pray, Lord, that you watch over us and provide for our church, prosper in its ways, and encourage us to grow in Christ. We pray for your blessing on our fellowship together, our love for you and for each other. We pray that you uh, advance your work in our world today. We do pray for our nation. We pray that you Deliver us from evil and help us to walk in the truth of your word. We pray that the light of your word would shine forth brightly and that you would bring great uh, deliverance from sin even in this day. We ask for your blessings on us through Jesus Christ and ask that you teach us to pray, even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Align us the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Final hymn this morning, number 35. 